Let's look at the early animals. For this lecture, be able to define Cambrian explosion, Ediacaran biota, sponge, cnidarian, gastrovascular cavity, bilateral symmetry, dorsal, ventral, anterior, and posterior, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm, coelom, pseudocoelom, segmentation, deuterostomia, lophotrochozoa, and ecdysozoa. Be able to relate the Cambrian explosion to invertebrate diversity. Describe a body plan in terms of symmetry, segmentation, and tissues. And identify characteristics of deuterostomes, lophotrochozoans, and ecdysozoans. Give examples. So what are animals? Animals are heterotrophic, multicellular eukaryotes. They're not fungi. So we know they're eukaryotes. Okay, so are fungi. They're heterotrophic. Okay, so are fungi. They're multicellular. Okay, so are fungi. But they have distinct tissue types. And there we got them. Fungi don't have distinct tissue types. So we're going to focus on the tissues when we're looking at animals. Because muscle and nervous tissues are found in all animals except sponges. The earliest animals we see are the Ediacaran biota. These are soft-bodied early animals, so they're not really leaving a lot of fossils, and it's kind of hard to really tell what is what. They likely grazed on algae that was growing on rocks, and that's a new niche. Those are herbivores, and because it was a new niche, the algae had really no way of dealing with it except just to regrow. So these were pretty successful. And they did well, but they stayed on the rocks. If only something could get out in the open ocean. Well, sponges were actually able to filter the open ocean while staying on the rocks. And we still have sponges today. We're going to look later on about how these actually changed the face of Earth and changed the ocean. Because this was quite an innovation. These filter feeders were a new niche. Now, they lack true tissues, and that kind of keeps them... They're an animal, but they're not... Um, what we call a eumetazoan, and we're going to look at those later on. They do have these coanocytes, and these are these little collared cells that move a flagellum and capture food particles in the mucus. They then share these food particles with amoebocytes that move around the body. They have an extracellular matrix made of spicules and can actually form large structures. These are the root of any animal phylogenetic tree because these are what was giving rise to other animals, like the cnidarians. This is part of eumetazo, what we call the true animals. They have muscle tissue, they have nervous tissue, and they have a digestive cavity. They have what we call a gastrovascular cavity, which means the mouth and the anus are the same aperture. They just take things in, digest them, and then put things back out in the same direction. They have a specialized organelle, which I really recommend you look into, called a nidoblast. This allows them to sting other things, paralyze them, and then bring them in for digestion. The cyphozoa are very notable by going out into the open ocean to feed on plankton. This opened up a new niche, and again, were highly successful. How successful? Well, the fact that all of you know what jellyfish are shows how successful cnidarians were. But the greatest success was yet to come. The Cambrian explosion occurred, well, in the Cambrian, when there was a diversity of animals arising, and most current phyla either arose during that time or highly diversified during that time. One of the hypotheses for how this happened was that there was the Hox gene diversification allowing segmentation and expansion of animal forms. Segmentation allows for specialization of each segment and allows for a multifunctional animal. There was also more oxygen in the atmosphere at this time, allowing for larger animals with more complex circulation. There were some new niches that arose. First off were highly mobile predators with claws. And this was a new thing that could prey on those soft bodied creatures. And of course, we see a new niche, defended herbivores. So the herbivores now start developing shells to pres preserve them from the claws. This may be a reason that we actually have fossilization as a bias in the Cambrian explosion. Some have said it is possible that there were just as many species before the Cambrian explosion, they just didn't have hard shells, and thus they did not leave good fossils, so we just don't know that they existed. The body plans of Cambrian creatures left behind more fossils. It's hard to tell how diverse life was before the Cambrian explosion because, well, they didn't leave any evidence of their existence. And macroscopic bony animals fossilize better. So that's one hypothesis for what happened during the Cambrian explosion is simply more hard parts. 
A body plan that was highly successful during the Cambrian was the bilateral body plan. This is bilateral symmetry, having a left side and a right side, a front and a back. And this has a complete digestive tract with a mouth and an anus separated by a long tube. This form evolved around 680 to 700 million years ago and expanded highly during the Cambrian. Here we can see some of these bilateral organisms living side by side with sponges. And there should be a jellyfish in the background, honestly. But we can see that the bilaterians would diversify later on and there would be plenty of them. How do we define these body plans? Well, let's look at these uh, with some good terms. We got the radial symmetry there. It's a circular or the bilateral symmetry with a front, a back, a left, and a right. We don't just say front, back, left, right. We say dorsal surface and ventral surface for the top and the bottom. We say anterior instead of front. We say posterior instead of end. And we say left and right because, I, honestly, we do that still. We still get confused. Your left or my left. Anyway. So animals have sensors on the anterior end because that's what's going to come in contact with the environment first. The tissues are also specialized. We're going to look at three types of tissues here. Remember plants having the three types of tissues? Well, animals have three types of tissues as well. The ectoderm gives rise to the covering and gives rise to the central nervous system. The endoderm gives rise to the digestive tract, the liver, and lungs. And the mesoderm gives rise to muscles and most other organs. These bilaterians can have different types of coelom. Uh, they can have a coelomate, which is no coelom whatsoever. They can have a pseudocoelom, which is an ectoderm-lined cavity. Or they can have a true coelom, which is shown here, which is mesoderm-lined on both sides. There is a wide diversity of invertebrates now, and we are going to look at these in three different categories. We're looking, all, the, all three of these are bilateral, of course. The deuterostomes, uh, that's when the mouth develops second in the body, and that's going to be your hemichordates, echinodermata, and the chordata. We'll look at those ones a little bit later. The lophotrochozoans, we'll look at somewhat in this lecture. Those have a lophophore and a trochozoan larval form. Yeah, kind of tough definitions, but that's, that's what we have to go to. And that's your platyhelminthes, which is actually an ace coelomat organism, the syndermata, the ectoprocta, the brachiopods, which we don't really look at in this class, but they're, they're still cool, the mollusks, and the annelids. You'll be dissecting some annelids in lab. The ectisozoans have a exoskeleton which they shed, and that would be the nematodes and the arthropods. Taking a look at the mollusks, they have three things that unite them. They have a foot, a visceral mass, and a mantle, which often gives rise to a shell. That shell can be on the exterior, such as with snails, the interior, such as with squid, or absent, like slugs. Nudibranches and other snails and slugs are in this group. Bivalves, such as clams, are in this group. And cephalopods, such as octopi, are in this group of mollusks. The arthropods, we're going to look at a few bits and pieces, bit by bit, uh, mainly the insect. What makes arthropods is that they have jointed legs. Arthro means jointed, and pods means, well, legs. This group was incredibly successful, as you can see by this trilobite. And those trilobites were everywhere. Look at the segmentation along this, allowing for all these legs. And some of those legs were specialized into one shape or another, and that segmentation allows specialization. We still see this segmentation in centipedes, millipedes, and insects. And that segmentation allows these parts to specialize. You're going to look at the crayfish in lab and look at how each segment has different types of legs. And in class, we're going to give examples of favorite arthropods to kind of cover the breadth and diversity as time allows.